This is awesome. Oh, lovely. Everybody's coming in. Hi, Beautiful. everybody. Oh, good evening. Good evening from Auckland. This is so exciting to see all of these beautiful women in New Zealand who've joined me today. Hello. Hello. Please, let's uh, do a round robin and introduce yourselves. Thank you. Hi, I'm, you. I'm Rosemary Killip. I'm Rosie, um, based in Wellington, sometimes in South Australia, but not for the moment. Saw COVID out in our home in Wellington. Okay, so you're here with us. Which part of Wellington? I'm in Lower Hutt. I'm right in the centre of town by the Botanical Gardens. Okay. I must come and see you sometime. We should meet and have a coffee. That yes. would be lovely. <laughs> Who else is in the room? Please introduce yourselves. Joanna. Uh, hi, my name is Joanne. Uh, I uh, live in Auckland. Okay. Well, welcome to the call, Joanne. Um, Adeseo. I hope I'm saying your name right. Yes. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, my name is Adesayo. I live in Auckland. I live precisely in West Auckland. I've been in West Auckland uh, for about 18 years now. Uh, so it's nice meeting you all. Beautiful. Fantastic. Well, you look nicely you. wrapped up there. Yeah, she looks warm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And we have Jean. Jean, where are you based? Hi, Gertrude. It's so great to be here. So good to see everybody else. Um, mm -hmm. I am based in Christchurch. Okay, South Island. So anytime you there? come down south, you can visit. <laughs> <laughs> got a friend got there now. Coffee here. Fantastic. So I run a sales training and leadership training uh, and coaching company, and I'm doing some business advisory services at the moment um, okay. for people here in Christchurch. Fantastic. Welcome to the call. Lovely to see you here. Who's next? Let's go around the room. We've got about four minutes before we start. Hi, I'm Winona and hey, I, Winona. Live, I live in Hawke's Bay. That's awesome. where I'm coming from today. We've got women from all over the country. I love this. Sasha, yeah. where are you based? <laughs> um, I'm based in Auckland. You're based in Auckland. Fantastic. Let's see who else do we have who hasn't said anything. Um, Swati. You're not on camera, but if you don't feel like being on camera, say something so we can get to know you. Where are you? Hey. <laughs> Hi. Hello, everyone. I'm Swati and I'm from Hamilton. Hamilton. Fantastic. Good to see um, you. Nice to see you on the call. Molibi, where are you based? Oh, there you Hello. are. Hey. I'm in um, Wellington. My daughter is really loud. That's why I'm just <laughs> quiet in the back here. I'm, I'm in Wellington, Central Wellington. Fantastic. Welcome to the call. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Then we have Nang. I hope I'm saying your name right. There you are. Hey. Hi. How are you? Where are you based? I am in Melbourne. You're in Melbourne. Welcome to the call. <laughs> this is Thank awesome. You. I thought I'd see just Kiwi women today, but that's fantastic. You are very welcome. My daughter's in Melbourne. I'm very worried about her. How are things going with COVID-19? Yeah. Nice. Um, sure. yeah, it's locked down. Um, yeah, we have a lot of cases, but uh, it's mm. not as scary as others people outside Melbourne think. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, we, we just hear the news and we worry and... <laughs> They can lock down. It sounds so dramatic. My daughter keeps saying, yeah, Mom, it's, it's no it's big deal. Like that, but um, it's actually okay. You know, you can live with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Welcome to the call. Thank you so much. We have Janine. Janine, hi. Where are you calling from? Uh, to uh, to Terangani. I hope I pronounced your name right. Come on, ladies, come online so we can get to know each other before we start. We have two minutes. I normally start dead on time. Hi. Hey. Sorry about that. I was scrambling to find my headphones. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Welcome to the call. Where are you based? Auckland, New Zealand. Auckland, New Zealand. Fantastic. Who else have we got on the call? Um, Wab Wabha? I hope I'm saying your name right. Hi. 
Um, can you hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. Oh, I don't. Uh, anyway, I'm mm -hmm. Vipa and I'm from Manawatu. Fantastic. Yeah. Glad to yeah, join you. Very cosmopolitan um, group of women here tonight. I love this. Who have I missed out? Is there anybody else who hasn't said hi? I think that's it. Uh, there's somebody with uh, an AM for a name. I can't see your name. Who is that? Okay, maybe you just want to be quiet for now. <laughs> but welcome, 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 ladies. I normally start dead on time, and I'm glad you all came a little few minutes early so we can at least get to know each other. Depending on how we go with this webinar, we will have a discussion at the end. So I normally do a 90-minute webinar. Ah, oh, there you are. Please introduce yourself. Hi. Kia ora. Uh, my name is Tuturangi Mahi. I am joining from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, USA. Oh, wow. But you're a Kiwi, obviously. Kia I ora. am, yes. <laughs> Kia ora. <laughs> Don't you wish you were back home right now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do, yes. <laughs> oh, fantastic. No, thank you, ladies. Thank you so much. I do always love to honor people when they show up on time for these events. So we will launch right into this webinar on how to speak on stage and get more gigs and get on the TED platform. There is a reason why you have all come online tonight. And I hope by the end of the evening, I leave you with lots of nuggets of wisdom on the next steps you should take, how you should take them and maybe work with me to help you get there. So imagine for a moment, a year from now, your annual salary became your monthly income. <laughs> and you had access to thought leaders, men and women that you only dreamed about getting access to and they're on your mobile phone, you can call them anytime. And you look back and you wonder why you wasted so much time not doing the things that got you the success that you deserve. During this webinar, we're going to discuss an amazing opportunity on how you can actually do this. And I will be sharing with you how I have actually done it throughout my speaking career, living here in New Zealand, but traveling all over the world. And I'm hoping that I'm going to put all of my power to motivate you, persuade you, influence you to come on board and be a change maker on this rocket ship that is literally taking the world by storm. Um, women's voices needs to be heard. I think you might have noticed that I target coaching women predominantly. It's for a very deliberate reason. One, because of where I'm from, coming from a country where women have no voices and being privileged to have lived in New Zealand now for 20 years and really seeing that from so far away from home, I've been able to make a difference in my country. So thank you for showing up. I want you during the session to be as proactive as possible. Type questions in the chat. If I say something that resonates, that really hits home, put that in the chat as well, because I do need to get feedback from you as to whether my content is helping people or not. And I recommend if you have a pen and paper to write things down. Um, a lot of times when you're being coached, if you write a few notes down, it reinforces the learning. So just have a notepad and a pen. It's not that you have to take heaps of notes, but I will send you the replay of this uh, webinar. But writing things down really helps you remember things as you are learning them. I'm going to ask you all to mute yourself so that we don't have any background noise. And let's try and not have any distractions, no dogs, no cats, no children jumping into the call so that we can have a really fast paced evening and connect in a very, very authentic way. So COVID-19, what does it really mean? The word crisis in Chinese is written with two symbols. The one symbol stands for danger. The second symbol stands for opportunity. I do believe we have been gifted 
by this pandemic an opportunity that some people will see and will grab it and will change their lives forever in terms of how they present themselves, how they build new businesses because of this crisis. And other people are not going to see it at all. And I want to start off by just sharing a little story of how COVID-19 has impacted me. I lost my mother-in-law at the end of March during the lockdown. And then I lost my own mom exactly three weeks later. And I haven't come online for weeks. I just have not had the energy or the strength to do what I do. And then a few weeks ago, I thought to myself, I'm so depressed. Am I honoring my mother's memory in terms of who she was? I didn't get to go to her funeral. I attended her funeral online on Zoom. And it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do. A lot of you who might have Googled my name and gone online, you would have seen that I had long hair. I cut all my hair off. The day of her funeral, I was so depressed. I just got a scissors and cut it all off because I wanted something to change. I wanted something to change and I was stuck in my home and it's like I'm in a time warp and it's a bad dream and I'm going to wake up and it's going to go away and it's not going away. My mom always used to say that, Gertrude, so long as you are on this side of the grave, don't give up. You get to choose how long you stay down. You have to dust yourself up and get up and do what you do. So that's why I'm on this call today. This is the third time I've appeared in public since my mother died. So why am I sharing the story with you? It gave me the gift of time. I was blocked off Facebook by some bizarre reason. I still, to this moment, don't know why. My Facebook account was hacked. I have a large following in the community on Facebook. I spent hours on Facebook, but I can't get back in. I created a second account. It got hacked. A third account, it got hacked. Then I thought, okay, I'm not supposed to be doing the Facebook thing. I'll just reinvent myself. And that's what I've done for the last three months. And Facebook is a distraction. It's a great place to connect, but it can distract you as well. And you can end up not really getting things done. So I've done a lot of things during the lockdown to build new communities on different platforms like YouTube, uh, particularly on LinkedIn. And I realized that there's so many people online right now. Just hold on a second. Marius, can I ask you to bring me a, a tissue, sweetie? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I realized that um, there's so many people online right now who are looking to be coached, to be mentored, to learn new things. And if you have an idea, if you have a message, if you have a method that can help somebody else, this is a fantastic time to use your speaking voice in a very different way. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that I've done uh, since the lockdown that have literally changed my, my speaking. Thank you. So Facebook ads right now are at an all time low. I did my first webinar two weeks ago. I advertised for three weeks. And I attracted, I think, 600 people. It was a webinar for Australia. I did it over a weekend on a Saturday and a Sunday with some phenomenal results. Facebook ads, they cost me per lead, I think, $2.50 to get people on that call. And in a weekend, I made 15,000 US dollars in two days. And I'm going to share with you how I did it. So for those people who do have processes, who do have ideas, who have ways to empower, coach, and teach somebody else, this is the time. So what is the process? And who does this process work for that I want to share with you today? It works for anybody who has a story to share. In Africa, we believe that 
you change the world through your stories. The minute you share your story with someone else, you're not only changing you, but you're changing them. The reason why I share my mother's story is because I'm trying to heal. I, we, we, we believe that if you keep it to yourself, if you go to a funeral in Africa, you don't grieve alone. Our funerals are a week, two weeks long sometimes. People will come to the house and they cry with you and they grieve with you. I can't do with that right now. But what I can do is to keep talking about her. And the more I talk about her, the more I'm slowly accepting her passing. And we also believe in Africa that the minute you share your problem with someone else, it's a problem halved. Tonight, you are taking my story with you. You're going to remember that there's this woman in Wellington who's grieving two mothers. I had just met my mother-in-law a year ago. She was based in Poland. And she died online as we were watching. We were on Skype with my husband's brother. She had a heart attack. He couldn't get anybody to come and help him. The neighbors wouldn't come. And for 17 hours, we sat with my husband's mother's body in the background, just trying to hold space for his brother until a coroner could come and declare her death and we could get the undertakers to come and take care of things. So when you share a problem, you have it. So it doesn't matter what your life experience is, whether it's positive, whether it's negative, if it's positive, great. You can be that source of inspiration to somebody else who is suffering right now, who doesn't know that there is another way of being. You know, when I tell people in Zimbabwe about the way that we live in New Zealand, it's like I'm telling them a fairy tale. I was born in a small village, in, in a village that had no electricity, no running water. Most of my relatives are in those villages today. And they watch me on their phones on Facebook, living in this beautiful home in New Zealand. And they can see that there is a possibility, especially if you educate your, your children. And that's what my parents did for me. So I share my story with people back home so that they can make sure their kids go to school and that they value education because education for me got me out of poverty. And that's the importance of story. Now, if you have developed a process, let's say for instance, you lost your husband and you are grieving. Let's say for instance, you had cancer and you managed to recover from cancer. There could be another woman out there who is waiting to hear how you did it. There's something about you that got you to where you are. Can you share that with somebody else and empower them? This process is for change makers. I love working with people who want to make a difference in the world, who want to change their environment. I love working with visionaries who want to create a better world for their families and their children. I love working with tribal leaders people who want to identify who their tribe is, who want to grow their tribes online and offline. I have a tribe of women change makers all over the world because I created my own speaking platform. And it has been the most incredible thing I've ever done. I launched it only last year and I'll share a little bit about that with you. But I also love working with social entrepreneurs. And by social entrepreneurs, it's those people who make money so they can make a difference, not just for themselves, but for their communities and to help other people in the process. I call myself a serial social entrepreneur. I've created multiple businesses in New Zealand and I make money so that I can have money to give away to support the most disadvantaged people in my community and back home in Zimbabwe. So that's what this program is about. It's about people who want to make a difference. So why should you bother having a speaking business that has a process that can generate income over and over again? A speaking business can generate passive income for you. If you are a speaker and you are able to package your story into a book, you can repurpose your intellectual IP and your ideas. Do you know that a memoir can be turned into a board game? that can be sold to teach people to do something. <clears throat> and it's all about creating an impressive digital footprint all over the internet 
so that people know who you are, they know what you stand for, they know what you teach. I want you to participate and just go onto Google right now, just for two minutes, and type in my name. Remember, my name is misspelled. It's Get Rude Mache, G E T R U D E, not Gertrude. Type in my name in Google and see how many references come up. Just do that quickly for a minute. And then while you're there, <clears throat> And when you have finished, just type in yes, so I can see that um, you've done the little exercise in the chat. Just type in yes in the chat when you've done that. Then go to Google Images and do the same thing. So you've already got Get Rude Much in Google, type in Images and see what happens. You're going to see hundreds of photographs of me. That's what I mean when I say you have to create a digital footprint. When you apply for a TED talk, they do their research. They want to find out who you are. They want to find out where you're speaking, how you've spoken, are you on YouTube, are you on Facebook? Where are you? Where is your digital footprint? And the fact that you can find hundreds of pictures of me is deliberate. A lot of people will have a photograph taken and then somebody invites them to come and speak at an event and they say, please send us your bio, send us your photograph. If you send a photograph that you have taken on your phone, a lot of times the phone will generate just random numbers, right? You have to rename the photograph with your name so that people can find your images. So Google cannot see pictures. It can see words. So if your photo has your file name, your pictures will show up on Google. That's part of creating a digital footprint that makes a real impression on people when they are looking for their TED speakers. You literally have to embody your message and be seen on and offline by the people who are looking for you to come and speak. So I'm going to show you a better way of operating your speaking career so that you can genuinely create more time and more money, whether you do it part-time or you decide to do it as a full-time business. So the mission for tonight is to take you through the TED Talk application process and share with you the results that it's produced for me because I'm really trying to inspire 1 million thought leaders and change makers around the world to share their stories and make a difference with their voices. Would you like to be one of those people? Are you up to the challenge? Do you want to inspire a million people as you're sitting in your home in New Zealand? That is possible now because there's millions of people online looking for content, looking for inspiration. This is our chance. Yes? Fantastic. Okay, so we'll move on. All right, so why is coaching so important? My first TED Talk was about 10 years ago. I winged it. I was invited by the mayor of Wellington, and I will explain a little bit about how I met her and what led me to that point. But coaching is important because when you have a coach, they can show you your blind spots. They can say, look left to another perspective that you haven't actually seen. There is a social revolution right now that is causing a serious disruption that can create a dramatic change for anybody who has a voice and they're using it. I ended up with five TED speaking opportunities. The last four were carefully orchestrated. I got a coach and I was shown my blind spots and I changed the way that I presented. And what happens is when you get on TED, you're no longer talking to a handful of people. You're talking to millions. It actually doesn't matter if you get to speak at a TED event and there's five people in the room. What happens is the minute your TED video is online, now you're talking to the world. You're addressing millions. So you can see, we've got about 21 people on this call. Every single time I present, I don't care if there's 100 or 200 or five, 
I deliver my speech as if I'm talking to millions of people because I'm going to post this video on YouTube and I tag it how to get a TED talk. Most of my clients come off YouTube. So knowing what to do with your video material as well is important. What are the key words that you put in the title of your, your, your video presentation? What are the key words that you tag the video with so people can organically find you? So if somebody was on YouTube and they typed in YouTube, how to get my first TED talk, I would probably pop up because I've actually optimized the video so it can get found. So whether you're speaking in public in front of people or not, it doesn't matter. Make sure that you go to a presentation and you have a friend who has a cell phone who's in the room, who's recording you speaking and post those videos online, post hundreds of them. I speak around one topic. My topic is the Ubuntu philosophy. And it came out of my book, which is called Born on the Continent Ubuntu. I managed to wrap my personal life story around an African philosophy. I did it because there's not a lot of literature that's written. If you Google the word Ubuntu, you will find Linux software online. And I knew that. I'm in IT. I know a lot of people think Ubuntu is, is an operating system, and it is. But what they don't know is that the operating system is based on this ancient African philosophy, and there's not many books written about it. And what happened with my first book is it transferred from being just an ordinary woman's story, a memoir, into an academic text. I lecture in universities all over the world in social anthropology as a philosopher. And I did not see that coming <laughs> when I started. People just started finding me because they were looking for the content. And Nelson Mandela made Ubuntu mainstream. He started talking about it a lot and then people started Googling it, but there's no books. I'm like the only one in like 10 authors who's written about Ubuntu. So your life story can be wrapped into a philosophy. It can be wrapped into a way of being. And then you get attention from other places that you hadn't even thought about. So that's another reason why you need to get on TED. You're getting that global engagement. And what TED also does is it helps you find your tribe and build your tribe online. And I'll share with you the process on how to put together your TED talk so that you identify who your tribe is. And my passion is really to help you find your life purpose, find the reason why you're on this planet, the reason why you're on this call, the reason why you're inspired to speak. Not many people do what we're doing, ladies. Not many people have the courage to stand up and be heard. It means that you were born with a knowing, you were born with a teaching that you're supposed to leave in the world. That's why you're on this call. So value your story, good or bad. And if you've had a difficult life experience, there's always something good out of every single challenge that we're encountered with. Find those blessings so that you can help somebody else who's going through a similar struggle to see that it will change. Hope is coming. It's not about what's happening in the current situation. That's why we share our stories. So the bonus that's going to come at the end of this is that I'm going to offer all of you a 30 minute consultation with me so that I can get to really understand where you want to go, what help you need, I asked you all to ask me questions before this presentation. Can you type in the chat how many people did that? And if you can wave, because we can't see everybody, how many of you contributed the questions? Okay, small handful. Type in the chat, please, ladies. I want to see how many people did that. The reason why I asked you to ask me questions is because sometimes you come on a webinar and so-called expert who's there to teach you something knows their content so well, but they don't know where the gaps are. I always get people to ask questions so that I can deliver appropriate content. And I recommend you do the same thing with all your speeches. So if you are going to an event and there's a certain theme that the organization wants you to talk about, ask them, what do you want the audience to get out of this presentation? That way you're going to deliver appropriate content to your listeners. 
because in at the end you know what you know so well you're an expert in your field you don't see your own blind spots the things that you take for granted that you know really well somebody else doesn't know those things so i always go to my audience first and i say this is what i want to talk about what would you like to know so i'm going to try and wrap some of your questions into this presentation the ones that I don't manage to wrap because I did get a good response, I'm going to create videos because what you've done for me is you've given me more content. Do you understand that? You've given me more things to talk about, questions that people need answered on how to get a TED Talk. So it's actually refining my webinars. It's refining my speeches. Does that make sense? Awesome. So always ask your audience. Now, if you scored yourself, I think I asked you to score yourself on a scale of one to 10. I said, how, how do you rank yourself in, TED, in terms of getting a TED talk? Type in the chat right now, how you rank yourself. Are you ready to get on TED? Just on a scale of one to 10, what, what, is, what is that for you from your perspective? A one, a two, an eight, a nine, a six. 1.5, 6, 7, keep going, 7, 5, 7, 5, 4, 4 and a half. This is great. It's always good to assess yourself in terms of where you feel you are. I'm hoping by the end of the presentation, you can rank yourself again and see if you are higher or lower than what you've given me in terms of the pre preparation for your speeches. So that again was a deliberate thing for me to assess at what level you actually feel you're at. A lot of times people hang, rank themselves higher than they really should. If you are ranking yourself high, why are you on this call? Why haven't you got a TED talk already? Okay, so just be aware of that. And those are those blind spots I was talking about that you're feeling you're ready, you're feeling you've got it, but you're pitching yourself and you're pitching yourself and nobody's asking you to come and speak. It means there's something not quite right, either in your pitch, either in your selection of TED Talks that you are approaching, because going to a TED presentation is not just about pitching to every TED Talk you see online. Every TED Talk has a theme. Have you done your research to see the theme of the TED Talk? and whether your content fits into the theme. And if not, can you modify your presentation just a little bit to incorporate the theme into your TED Talk? Does that make sense? So I think I sent you links to my three TED Talks. You'll see that the first one was just crazy, random, delivered really well, but I missed a lot of opportunities. I talked about my book. I just written a book. Never talk about the fact that you're an author. It puts people off on TED. It comes off as if you're trying to sell. So people will find your book if your presentation is good. They will Google you and you've got your bio on the TED website that says you're an author. You've written several books. So never talk about your book. That was one of my biggest mistakes in my first TED talk. I started off my first TED talk with an element of surprise. So look at the TED talk that I did in Wellington. The announcer said, you know, Gertrude Macho is coming on stage. And people looked on stage and I wasn't there. I started my presentation from the audience. I was in the audience in pitch black. And that's where I started from. So how can you carve an element of surprise in how you get started when you're speaking? That's really important. They say that there is a 30 second rule to, pre to presenting. Whether you're talking to a manager, whether you're talking to someone one on one, whether you're presenting in front of 3000 people. In the first 30 seconds, you have to give people a sound bite and you have to give people a visual bite. Mm. The sound bite means suck me into your story straight away that I want to know more. Intrigue me. Let me feel who you are. The reason why I started this presentation with a personal story is so that you can get a sense of who I am. 
I'm just a woman like all of you. There's nothing special about me. And when you share something that is in common with every human being, it could be you share a story of the day your baby was born. It could be you share a story of the day that your mother died. It could be you share a story of the day you got your first job. Use a universal theme to start your presentation that everybody can relate to. That way they can relate to you. That's when you start speaking the language human. There's actually a language that transcends race, religion, ethnicity, and that is the language of humanity, where you talk about the things that affect us all. If I share a story of my mother's passing, if you have a mother who died, you can relate to my story. If you have a mother who's alive, you can relate to my story. Does that make sense? The visual bite that you have to deliver to your audience is how you look. I'm going to go through a little bit later about personal branding. Have you personally thought about yourself as a brand? How are you showing up? When you are a speaker, you are no longer you. You are a product. You are a Microsoft. You are a Coca-Cola. You are a Nike. How does that brand show up? And I'll share with you my personal branding strategy that I coach people through. I do a personal branding workshop with all of my speakers. And I'll share with you how I came upon my own brand that's really made me stand out here in New Zealand. So they say that if you are watching a game of soccer, who sees most of the game? The players or the spectators? Now I want you to unmute yourself and say something while I take a swig at my drink. Who sees most of the game? I don't. <laughs> players or spectators? There's two choices. Anyone, just say anything. Player. I'm sorry, the spectator. Spectator. Right, the let's player. put up our hands. How many say players? Okay, how many spectators? Right. The people who said players are right. You know why? In a game of soccer, there's probably three or four minutes that determine whether somebody wins or somebody loses. And it's the people who are on the field, see the ball coming, and they kick it and they score. So tonight, you are all players. You want to play this game. You want to know how to get on TED. You realize the importance of it. That's why you're investing these 90 minutes to be on this call. So I want you to take action with everything that I'm going to share to make sure that you get your next TED talk. Don't make this 90 minutes just be a night of entertainment and then you go home and nothing happens. So in every story that you will ever tell, there's what's called an arch to the story. The arch to a story is three part. Every story has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. So when you're writing your speech, make sure that you know what you're going to say in the beginning. The beginning is your setup, where you're telling your audience what you want to present about. The middle is the confrontation. It could be that you're telling a personal story and you're going to share all of the ups and the downs of your lives, the challenges you've gone through, the successes that you've had. The end is your conclusion. Now, what's in a conclusion? That has to be something that gives your viewers a resolution to your story. And it gives them a call to action something that they can do when they go home after your speech. Some tangible, this is how you do it, step by step. So when they say TED is, the tagline is ideas worth spreading, the reason is they're looking for people who can teach other people to change the world. 
and have an idea that's worth spreading, an ideology that's worth spreading. What is that for you? What is your idea worth spreading? How is it going to change the world? And I'll take you through the questions that are asked on every TED platform to help you present. There is a TED talk. I spend hours on TED researching, finding out who the best speakers are, which ones are trending, how do they get those 5 million you know, views. I will Google people who are speaking around philosophy and I want to see how they're presenting their philosophical ideas. If you're someone who's in mental health, go on to TED and type in mental health. You know, all the speech presentations are cataloged. See how the people who got onto the TED platform have delivered their content. They say that success leaves clues. Successful people will give you the blueprints to follow. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. I'm not saying copy them, but see what they've done. See how you can shape yours differently. It helps you choose catchy titles because the title of your presentation is really important. That's again impresses the TED organizers. If it's a catchy headline, a headline that is intriguing, that makes people think, what is that? I want to know more. So use the TED platform. So I want you to watch a TED talk. It's called The Secret Structure of Great Talks. It's a scientist who actually did some research on the best public speakers in the world, people like Martin Luther King, uh, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, um, J.F. Kennedy. There is a rhythm to how these speeches are written. And it's actually a graph. If you listen to Martin Luther King's speech, he starts off with what is the, the condition of African-American people. Then he takes you to the dream, what could be, and it plateaus. Then he brings you down to the current condition and how people are suffering. And he takes you back up to the dream, to the vision. So if you can take people through a roller coaster ride of emotions in your presentation, you have to make them laugh. You have to make them feel, you have to make them cry. If people walk out of your presentation and they just feel the same way they felt when they came in, you haven't delivered effectively. Your TED talk isn't going to go very far. So my coaching process is called speaking from the heart. And let me tell you a little bit about who I am. So I came to New Zealand 20 years ago with three small children under the age of 12. I had a three-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old. We didn't even have enough money for my husband's air tickets to come to New Zealand. So I came out here as an act of faith because I wanted to find a safe place to bring up my kids. We were in the middle of, this is now my second pandemic. I was actually laughing with my kids this week that if I get through COVID-19, I have another story to tell because I lived through the AIDS pandemic. And we were affected so badly. There were no drugs. There wasn't any antiretroviral medication. You would see a relative who's been infected by the AIDS virus. And within two, three months, they would just slowly start losing their hair, losing weight and withering away and dying. The reason why I decided to come is because the year I was coming to New Zealand, our medicine men in Zimbabwe started spreading a rumor that if you rape a virgin, it cures AIDS. Mm. The incidence of child abuse in Southern Africa went up overnight. You can Google this. It was called the virgin cure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My husband was an obstetrician. He was a doctor. And he came home one night in tears, having had to do a hysterectomy on a nine-month-old baby who's been gang raped by three men. That is why I'm in New Zealand. I told my husband, we have to leave. I want to bring up my kids in a safe country where I don't have to look over my shoulder in fear that something will happen to them. So I packed a small suitcase and as an act of faith, I came to this magical continent and life has been magical from the, land, the day I landed in New Zealand. I created companies. I started off as a systems analyst. So IT was my profession. I got a job here in Lower Hutt. I then went into business because I wanted to look after my kids. 
running from Lower Hutt to Wellington and back. I was living in Wellington with three kids. It took a year for my husband to come to New Zealand. So I was alone with three kids under the age of 12 and going crazy. I decided to be an entrepreneur. Started a, recru a recruiting business for doctors. Ran that company for 13 years, multi-million dollar business. I started a property investing company. I started buying houses in New Zealand 20 years ago when you didn't even need a deposit to buy a house. Within six years, I had bought 14 properties and I would raise the money by working part-time, ironing people's clothes after work. I realized that everybody in New Zealand had washing machines and dryers. And I'm thinking, who's washing all these people's clothes? I'm from Africa. We have domestic servants. We have somebody who helps you in the home in the home and i found this little niche put an advert in the local newspaper and i said i'll pick up your laundry iron it and bring it back my phone was ringing off the hook i was making six to seven hundred dollars a week ironing clothes at night with a full-time job i would get home feed my kids do their homework put them to bed from nine o'clock until 2 a.m i was ironing and i raised money to buy my first house it went up in value within a year $100,000 equity. I bought a second property, a third one. I wrote a, a book called The Property Squillionaire because it felt like a game. I was, it was like I was playing Monopoly. And because I had the courage to do some really daring things, I would go and see a developer with $500 in my, in my, my purse without a deposit. And I'll be honest and say, look, I have a few houses. I don't have money to buy your property. Can we negotiate? So the time that you're building this house, I can pay my deposit slowly and people would say, yes, I was just honest. And that's what helped me build my property business. It was valued at 4.5 million in 2017. But I came to this country with a suitcase, no money, three kids. So I wrote a book and I started teaching refugee women in the refugee community, not to sit at home and be frustrated because they couldn't speak English but to see other ways of making an income from home the same way I had done. I started teaching what I was doing. So all of you have things you've done in your life that you can teach. Use the TED platform to teach. I then got into film when Peter Jackson was filming King Kong. They were looking for African extras for one scene. And I used to be an actress in Zimbabwe, went to a presentation where one of Peter Jackson's staff was talking about making of Lord of the Rings plucked up the courage to ask if I could act in one of the movies and they were looking for Africans. So I got cast in Avatar, I got cast in King Kong and I took part in both films, but I turned it into a business because I said, I know a lot of African people. Can I present the people that I know? And I created a casting agency for people of color who took part in Avatar and King Kong and all of the films that are made in Wellington. I supply those ethnic extras. So what have you done that you can teach? I'm sharing my little stories so you can really go back into your life story and see what are those small things you've done that are worth sharing and worth spreading. Okay, so I started, my latest business venture is my own speaking platform. It's called the Her Story Women's Global Empowerment Conference. I am creating a platform for women like Ted strictly for women, where women come and share their stories. We have different themes from business and entrepreneurship, health and wellness, family and relationships, social justice, spirituality. In the creativity section, you can dance, you can paint, you can, you can paint a picture. I launched it in July last year in Las Vegas. I did one in Wellington in December. So in July, I was in Las Vegas. December, I'm in Wellington. No, no, in November, I'm in Wellington, December, Sydney, beginning of the year, I had a conference in Norway, I had one in London, I had one in New York, then COVID-19 hit, I had to cancel 15 events. This pandemic hit me financially in such a bad way because I had paid for all of those venues, hotel bookings, flights, and I could not get a refund. So I sat here and I thought, okay, how can I reinvent myself? And what happens for me is when I hit rock bottom is when I get really creative, the ideas come because my back is against the wall. I don't have a choice. I've got to do something different. And so I've taken her story online. We're now having online webinars. We're having online seminars. We coach and I'm teaching all of my speakers 
to do the same thing that I've done. So use this opportunity now, because if you go on LinkedIn and say hi to somebody right now, people are responding more than they did before COVID-19. It's because people are seeking connection. People are wanting to connect. And that's another gift that COVID-19 has given us. So who is your target market? When you create your speech, who are you talking to? I want you to type in in the chat. If you know your target market, who your avatar is. I'll tell you mine. It might help you think about it, but keep typing as I speak. My target market are women over the age of 50. The reason why I target women over the age of 50 is because they're decisive. They have the stories. They want to use their voices. A lot of women have never used their voices effectively their whole lives. So it taps into my coaching business. They have the time. They don't have little kids. They have the money to invest in themselves. That's why I target women over the age of 50. And the beautiful thing about women over the age of 50 is that they also are technophobic. They don't know about social media. They don't know about websites. They don't know how to use these social media platforms. So that's where I come in and I can coach them. I can mentor them and we can even do it for you. You can get a virtual assistant who takes all over all of your social media stuff and you don't have to do it yourself. So I can see now that a lot of you are very clear. The reason why you need clarity is because the way you speak to a young woman who is 25 to 35 is different from a woman who's 45 to 65. The words you use, the colors you're going to use, the platform you're going to advertise on. If you're looking for a younger demographic, the millennials, the 25 to 35s, you'll find them on Instagram. If you're looking for the older woman, you will find her on LinkedIn, you'll find her on Facebook. So sometimes people advertise on the wrong platform and they don't realize why they're not getting through to the people they're trying to get to. But the importance of knowing your avatar for the TED platform is so that when you deliver your speech, the people who hear your message, who you're trying to target, will grab your idea and will run with it. I have people who email me after they watch my TED Talks online and say, Gertrude, I've started a nonprofit because all of everything I do is about social justice. It's about what are you doing in your community to make a difference? That's my source of inspiration to other people. Those are my tribe. Those are the people that I want to inspire and make a difference in the world through them. So you get that feedback. It's just fascinating. I think on a daily basis in the last 20 years that I've been speaking, I get two, three emails daily. It's either somebody who came to a presentation I gave or it's somebody who found me online through YouTube. And they'll say, get you, I watched you speak. I heard what you've done. And I went and I implemented. I started a nonprofit. I'm helping the children in my community. I'm helping an animal refuge. You know, so people will take action. And that's why your idea is worth spreading. If you know who you're talking to, if you know who your avatar is. And when you're advertising on Facebook, people waste money. People say, oh, everybody want, should know about my, my, my message. Everybody needs what I'm selling. There is a 33% rule to anything you do, whether you're selling a product, a service, speaking online. 33% of people will love you. They will love everything you do. 33% of people will hate you. They think you're stupid. They think your message is totally not worth listening to. And 33% of people just don't give a damn. They're just indifferent. So who is your 33%? Then when you go on Facebook and you're putting your ad, you put in your demographic, women, in Wellington from the age of 45 to 65, then they show up on this call. Does that make sense? And I'm not saying that you don't have to talk to the younger demographic. They will come too. There's a, quite a few young women on this call, right? Put in your ages in the chat for me so I can see. I deliberately targeted women from the age of 45 
to 65 plus. We've got a 32 year old, a 30 year old. So you young ladies, there was something about my ad that spoke to you. If you look at the, the page where you registered, I had these qualifier questions. Do you have a message and a story to tell and want to get on a TED platform? Do you want to create a six figure income? There's something I said that brought you here, but I wasn't looking for you. My demographic is much older, but you showed up. So it's when you choose your avatar, you're not cutting off the other people. You're just being laser focused on who you really like to work with. And the younger people will show up and you can service them as well. So get clear who your avatar is. Get clear who you're talking to through your TED Talk. So let me show you how I got my results. I'm going to share my screen because these slides are quite important and I want you to, to see what I did. I wrote a book as a way to raise money to help the orphaned children in my immediate family when I moved to New Zealand. It costs $5 to send a child to school in Zimbabwe, five US dollars, three months of education, 15 US dollars a year. Most of the kids in my village cannot go to school because the average person in Zimbabwe exists on the equivalent of 30 US cents a month. Kids are at home. Most of the kids that I was servicing were AIDS orphans. They were relatives. My grandmother had 11 children. She had 34 grandchildren. 19 of my first cousins died of HIV-related diseases. There were 49 orphaned kids on my side of the family alone, another 40 on my ex-husband's side. 89 kids between the two of us. So I wrote my book. I wrote my story. I self-published. And I would look for speaking opportunities to sell 100 copies of this book a month. I went all over Wellington. I looked for free speaking engagements. As a way to sell this book, the book was a fundraiser. I approached Rotary Clubs, Lions Clubs, Probus Clubs, any social networking club. They're looking for speakers. If you put in the rotaryinternational.org website, your zip code right now, you will find five, six, 10 Rotary Clubs. They meet in the morning, they meet in the afternoon, they meet in the evening, where you can go and present for free, but they buy books. You know why they buy? Because they are the older demographic. They have the time to read. They buy books for their children. They buy books for their grandchildren. They read books. But what happened is, I would sell 100 copies. I would make 3,500 every month by selling my book. Then people in those organizations started passing my name to event planners. There were people who were owners of businesses who were running conferences. I didn't look for a speaking career. It evolved through my giving to my community. Then I started getting hired to speak. Then I invested in myself and I found a coach and I started perfecting the way I spoke. I found mentors, women that I could emulate online and copy and see how they were doing. And then I started coaching other people to speak. I started coaching people to write their own books and the rest is history. The last 20 years have been absolutely magical. But the thing that changed everything for me was going to Mexico and speaking at a conference that had... 3,000 people. At the end of my presentation, there is a man who came up to me and he hugged me. And there was an electrical charge that zapped. It was almost like static between us. And the hair on his chest stood up like this. The hair on his arms. It was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. And he said to me, Gatry, do you realize that you channel when you speak? I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't do that. He said, you are channeling. There is an energetic field. There's something going on here. And he advised me to go onto the Heart Math Foundation and do some research about how I was using my heart to speak. And that's how I developed my coaching program called Speaking from the Heart. The Heart Math Institute has done research that proves that the human heart gives out a magnetic pulse that spans the length of your arms, especially when you're speaking. This is why when you listen to people who are really powerful speakers, you get goosebumps, you feel them. We all have that ability 
to connect with our hearts, with our audiences. I started reading, doing this research, and it's all free. It's all online. You guys should go on there. They run programs. And I learned how to use my heart to deliver authentic presentations. And it has been fascinating because speaking from the heart helped me pitch myself to event organizers. When you pitch yourself to TED, you have to give a two-minute audition video. So they want you to synthesize your story in two minutes. It's very, very difficult. And there's a process on how to cut out the fluff and get straight to the point in terms of what is my idea worth spreading. That is the first impression they get, on, get off you when you present. It's that two-minute audition video. Then you have to show your credibility. And remember how I talked about creating a digital footprint and giving presentations and posting them on Facebook and Instagram, on Twitter, on, on YouTube? That's what gives you credibility because they will go online and search to see where have you been speaking. You could just say, spoke at a Rotary meeting, spoke at a Probus meeting. It doesn't matter that you're not being paid, but they want to see you in action, embodying your message. Then I st you can start creating your own events like what I've done with my events. And you can share your vision with and lead your own tribe. Because that's what TED does. It's for tribal leaders, people who want to reach a community of change makers and work with them. And then you really start to impress these TED organizers. And so speaking from the heart is not about being technically perfect. So you can go to Toastmasters and they can teach you precisely how to put your speech together, how to deliver it. You can get the technical perfection, but if you don't have the emotional perfection, you will never be able to deliver an authentic presentation. And that's what I teach. That's what Speaking from the Heart is all about. So when I got my coach, this picture here is my first TED Talk. That's me and my daughter in Wellington. I got invited to speak at a TED Talk in upstate New York in September last year. In November, no, in February this year, I did a, a talk in, 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 uh, in Auckland. But in between that, I had two other TED Talks that I had to turn down. One of them fell on my daughter's wedding day and the other one fell on my wedding day. So I, I missed two opportunities. I could have been a five-time TED speaker. But it was just fascinating to see that I had cracked what TED, speakers, uh, TED organizers are looking for. So the training is tailored for your needs. It's tried and it's tested. I'm giving people all of my years of coaching from some of the best coaches in the world. It's interactive, so you're not on your own. And I create support groups online so that we inspire each other, we share, we get feedback from each other. Because speaking, just the same as being a, an author, is a very isolated experience. A lot of times we're all doing this on our own and it can be difficult when you're not getting direct feedback from other people. So this training is for those people who want to inspire who want to be authentic in their deliveries. I'll stop sharing my screen. And now I want you to take notes because I'm going to take you through the things that are asked on a TED application. And I'm happy to share with you my TED application document so that you're not reinventing the wheel and struggling with what is it they're asking me? What is it I should be saying about my presentation? So every TED website has got a form that you fill out. And I'm going to share these questions with you now. And this is now part of the things I want you to take home. When you go home, sit down and think about these questions. In the beginning of the application, they ask you the general things, your name, your age. They want to know your online presence, so you have to share with them your Facebook links, your Instagram, your Twitter, your YouTube, if you're on Pinterest. If you don't have those already set up, I recommend you do it now because that's what's called your speaker's platform, and that's what's called your author's platform. People look. How many people are following on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter? If you're trying to sell a book to a publisher, 
That's where they go to see what your platform looks like online. So create those platforms right now. That's something you can do really easily. Then, of course, they want you to share the links to all of your websites. If you don't have a website, please get a website. It's very easy to get a website up using uh, WordPress. But make sure that when you write your website content, if you don't know how to write website copy, look for help, reach out to me. I can help you because I have a team who help people write their website. So on a web page, you have to optimize your website with the keywords that say who you are. So if you're saying you're a motivational speaker on the page where you're talking about, about Gertrude, the word motivational speaker has to appear in the first paragraph, in the middle, in the end, and there should be no less than 300 words per page. So search engines love words. Every page should have a minimum of 300 words and keywords so that when somebody types in that they're looking for a speaker who speaks about depression, on your website, dedicate a page on mental health where you mention the word depression three times. That's all about search engine optimization. So creating a website that actually generates traffic. A lot of people have websites that are just online brochures. They don't give them any work. They don't bring them any business. So you need to make sure that you have a search engine optimized website. The other thing that they're looking for on this application is the organizations you've been involved in. So whether you've started a company, whether you volunteer for a company, whether it's a place that you work, list the organizations that you're involved in. You could be involved in a social uh, networking group like, like Rotary or, or Lions or Probus. Make sure you list all the organizations that you belong to. And then they want photos of you. So you need to give them a link to a Google Drive with multiple pictures of you. Don't give them one photo. Because there could be something in your photo that they think, oh, yeah, that's a catchy outfit she's wearing. That will look good on our website. So don't just pitch with one photo. Give them a, a, a link to your Google Drive where there's multiple photographs of you. The next thing they'll ask for is videos of your speaking. And I've already talked about this. So every time you go and give a presentation, go with a friend, ask someone in the audience. I do that. I just sometimes give my phone to the person who's sitting in the front row and like, please, can you record my speech? Because sometimes the organizers of the event will give you the videos, but it comes much later. But if you've got your own, you can have it on your website and you have control over how you optimize the, the, the video. Yet if you get the video from the organizers, they've already done that and it's not really directed for you, it's directed for their organization. Does that make sense? And then every time you speak, also get somebody to ask people in the audience for testimonials, video testimonials. So when you went onto my, my, my page, when you registered, you saw that there were people talking about me. That is deliberate because it's hard for you to self-promote, but it's easy for somebody to promote you. Does that make sense? And do it right at the end of the speech. Have somebody at the door. Just say to a friend, look, just stop one or two people and say, do you mind giving a testimonial for Gertrude? What did you think about her presentation? What is the one take home that you got? And would you recommend this, this presentation to someone else? Ask three or four people every time you speak and then put those video testimonials on your website. Strip out the audio and get that audio transcribed. Now you've got the words in writing. And you can put those words, testimonials on your website as well. And that, again, goes towards building your credibility as a speaker and how people are experiencing you. Then they ask the generic things, your address, your email, your phone, the industry you want to speak in. So your industry and occupation is now going to be very important on your TED Talk application. This is where now you are targeting the TED Talks that are relevant to your industry. And even if they aren't, remember how I said, you can always find a way to position yourself within that industry. So when I'm asked to speak at a property investors conference, 
I go in as an entrepreneur. Property investors are entrepreneurs. I can position myself in that way. When I'm asked to speak as a change agent in a bank, I normally go and help ANZ Bank with staff morale because I've got a human resources degree. I majored in industrial psychology and management. I go in with a completely different hat. So don't be a one horse pony. You have to show TED organizers that you are very multifaceted. You have different ways that you can present your content, whether it's in social justice, whether it's in business, whether it's in personal. Does that make sense? Don't be a one horse pony. A lot of people make that mistake and, and they wonder why they don't get picked. Your bio, you have probably about, let me see how long mine is. Word count, I have about 140 character bio. So always create a bio that's 50 words. That's about 150 words. That's 300, that's 450 words because different organizers will want different lengths of bios that just encapsulate who you are. So mine says Getrude is a motivational speaker and is described as a vibrant bundle of African energy. She is passionate about helping people achieve their full potential and find their life purpose. You always have to write your bio in the third um, person as well, not in the first person. So it's almost like somebody is saying these things about you. Does that make sense? So write your bio and I'm going to be sharing everything I'm talking about here. So you can have mine and, and see how you can model that. Then what is your proposed idea? This is where people get stuck about what is my idea worth spreading? So I've done three TED talks about Ubuntu, but what I do is, I look at the theme of the, 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 the conference and I think, how else can I talk about Ubuntu? And then I talk about it from a different perspective. Right now I'm working on a TED talk about COVID-19 and how COVID-19 is really a gift that has connected humanity. We're all feeling this. We're all affected by this. And in Ubuntu, we believe that the human race is like the human body, that we are one. We're cells of the same organism. And when you cut your finger and you start to bleed, your white blood cells will rush to that point to heal it. So I'm trying to position Ubuntu a wrapped around COVID-19 because it's very topical right now. Are you with me? So sometimes you look for those things that are trending in society to piggyback your content things that are relevant in, in that moment in time. And I haven't found a title yet, but I said, imagine for a moment if we could solve the world's problems like our blood heals wounds. So if humanity is an organism, if we are one, we, our white blood cells, we should be reacting to each other in the world. So that's how I'm going in this time with my presentation. So try and find something that is topical, that is trending, that you can wrap your content around to make you more attractive when you are, you're pitching your TED talk. The next thing that they ask is, why does this idea matter to you? Why are you passionate about it? Now you can see from the way I talk about Ubuntu that this is something that I live, that I breathe, that I believe in, that I teach, that I want to get as many people to, to get and to grasp as a way of living. Why is it important to you? Why would you wake up every day and talk about your subject matter? Give me some feedback, just type in the chat. Why is your idea worth spreading important? Why are you passionate about this? Give me your contributions, please, because this is going to be really interesting to see how clear you are. Remember how I said that this workshop is, is um, this webinar is very interactive? This is where the teachings come because somebody might type in the chat something that makes you think, oh, I hadn't thought of my presentation that way. Are you with me? So somebody said here, changing leadership one person at a time. Thank you, Jean. I like that because every human being has the potential to change the world. Beautiful. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, Jody, because 
it's about systems change that empower women to engage in fitness, health, and wellness activities that empowers them to get the most out of life. Fantastic. Because everybody deserves to live their dreams and their best lives. You, you girls are really onto it. You need to know why this should be the air that you breathe. This should be the subject that you talk about. Beautiful. Thank you for contributing. Now, somebody said, I can't articulate mine. Do you want to unmute and just share for a second? I want you in two minutes to tell me what your presentation is about. Molibi, just unmute yourself and contribute quickly because this is now where the teaching comes in about this webinar. Thank you, Ma. Um, for me, it's about um, sharing stories um, and also shedding light on education, how education, African education can actually change to be more of an active learning approach and how that can be um, implemented. Well, it's, there's always talks about it. There's always um, documentation and policies about it, but never really the implementation part. Where, where are you based? I'm in, <laughs> I'm in Wellington. You're in Wellington. But your passion is about education in Africa, right? Yes. Okay, so that is very important. And I'll, I'll, what I would do if I were you is tell the stories of how education has impacted you. And especially education in the way that you see it should be done. I can relate to that because when I was uh, 13 years old, I had an English teacher who came to Zimbabwe. And in Africa, our education is you're stuck in a classroom, the windows are closed, it's hot, the kids can't really function, they can't think. And this guy came and he took us outside for our English lesson. And he made us lie down on the grass and he told us to close our eyes. And he read a poem by Wilfred Owen, Wilfred Owen's first World War poetry. That's what made me an author. I could see this man painting pictures with words in my head. And that's what you're talking about, right? So you need to show why is it important for education to be interactive, for it to be taught differently in Africa. This is my passion. This is what I want to happen in my home country. Are you with me? And, and start from a personal perspective on how education has impacted you. I told you I got out of poverty because I got an education. I'm here in New Zealand because I got an education. I articulate in English because I got an education. I would not be who I am if I didn't get a good education. So that's how I would wrap that in, in my presentation. I hope that helps. Okay, so let's move on because this application is really long. The next thing they ask you is, how is this a new idea? So you remember how we said it's ideas worth spreading? What's novel? What's new about your concept? People want to know that. Now, my idea isn't new. My idea is an ancient African philosophy that nobody has talked about. And when I put in my TED application, I told them that. There's nothing new about what I do. I just have a passion to bring in ancient African teachings and learnings and philosophies. Africa has got so much to teach people in the way that we are, in the way that we live. Because Ubuntu is about empathy. It's about compassion. It's about connection. In Zimbabwe, you will never sit next to a stranger and not talk to them. You will never stand at a bus stop in a queue in the bank and not say hi and strike a conversation. When I moved to UK, I was 19 years old. And for the first time in my life, I lived in a community where people did not look me in the eye. People would look through me like I wasn't there. I'd be at a bus stop and I'll say, good morning. And they would look away and I'd phone my mom and say, mom, I feel like I'm disappearing. Because my upbringing was that I was so connected to everybody around me. That's what Ubuntu is. 
So although my idea is a new, I am bringing it to the new world. I'm bringing it to the West. And that's why it's worth spreading. Okay. So get really clear because that's a really important question. Then they ask you about your proposed title for the talk. So right now, my title for this thing is Imagine for a moment if we could solve the world's problem like our blood heals wounds. It's too wordy. I know that. I still have to work on making it a bit shorter. Somebody said to me the other day during a webinar, Getrid, why don't you say something like um, uh, Ubuntu versus COVID-19 or COVID-19, the Ubuntu gift that unites us. So I'm, I'm using the COVID-19 in the, 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 the title. I still haven't perfected it, but you have to pitch with a working title. You can change it. You can change it as you go. So think about your idea worth spreading. Again, go onto the TED website, look at other people's ideas worth spreading. How do they articulate their, their thing? And then they ask you to outline your talk. They ask you to talk about what you're going to say in the beginning, in the middle, and the end. So you remember what I said about the arch of a story? They will also ask you the length of your presentation. Now on TED, you can talk up to 18 minutes. Do not go over 18 minutes. Otherwise, your video will never see the light of day. If it goes beyond 18 minutes, it does not get on the TED platform. And when I coach people to speak, we always coach you to speak for 15 minutes. Because what happens is when you're on stage, there's an audience reaction that takes up time. People, you pause when people laugh, you pause when you get a reaction. So if you plan your speech dead on 18 minutes, you're gonna go to 19 or 20. So always under estimate that. And the shorter your TED talk is, I actually coach people to do a 12 minute TED talk because people's attention span is very limited right now. There's so much content coming at us. But if you can see a little video and it's only 12 minutes, you'll stop and watch it to the end, right? So the shorter, the more succinct it is, the better. The TED organizers, however, will want you to commit to a 15 minute talk, but you don't have to do that. They do that because they have a program they want to fill, but your aim is to get on Ted's platform, get visibility with a short, succinct presentation that will reach millions. So that's something else that I learned from my last Ted talk. It was dead on 13 minutes and it was absolutely perfect. Okay, then they ask you to give them the one to two minute audition video. And I'm going to share in this um, document of mine what mine is. And then they will say, what are the implications of your idea? And put in another way, what will or will not happen if people do not know about your idea? How will it impact the world? And this is now where that call to action I was talking to about the end of your speech comes in. You have to say why. Why is it important for you to share it? For me, I know that if I can get as many people as possible to know what Ubuntu is, to have authentic connections with people, husbands, wives, with their families, with their kids and their homes, how people connect in their community, how they do things to help other people around the world, my job on earth is done. That's why I'm on this planet. That's the reason why I incarnated in the skin as an African woman. So how are you going to articulate that for you? Okay, tell them this is my life purpose. This is my life's work. And then they also ask, how has this nominee impacted the world? How have you already impacted the world? And this is where you list all of the things you've done. Have you been volunteering for the refugee service? Do you help out at your children's school? What are the philanthropic things that you have done in your life? Remember how I said that TED is about change makers? It's about people who take action. What have you done in your life to get you to this point that says you're a change maker and you're worth listening to? All right, we're almost finished. The application is very long. It's very tedious. Um, why are you the right person to speak on this topic? 
is another question. And for me, Ubuntu is a way of life. It's the way, it's the community I was born. It's the way I was brought up. It's a philosophy that I embody. So I do feel that I'm an authority to teach about Ubuntu because I was immersed in that culture and became an expert just being African. If it was a European person talking about Ubuntu, they might have a completely different explanation. They might have visited Africa and experienced it and now feel, I want to share this with my community. This is what I felt when I went to Africa. Make sense? So it always has to be, again, relevant to you. The next question, what do you want the audience's initial takeaway to be? Or how will your talk impact the audience? Remember how I said that there should be a call to action at the end of your speech, some tangible take homes? Please watch my TED talk, my second TED talk in upstate New York on Nuanta one. At the end of my talk, I say that to implement the Ubuntu operating system is very simple. Put your family first, put your community next, and if you have something to spare, do something somewhere else in the world. I gave three things that people can do when they come home. It starts with family, your community, and you do something global. Bev, can I ask you to mute? So your call to action is crucial. They want to know what the audience are going to do when they leave that TED venue and they go home and they execute and they implement. Then they ask about areas of importance, your childhood towns, your family location, frequent travel spots, your college town. They ask some really weird things. They also ask a question, a fun fact about you. And the fun fact about me is that I'm an African woman with a misspelled German name. So, <laughs> and there's a story to why my name is misspelled. And I tell the TED organizers when they interview me, because they ask, why do you have this weird name? Well, I was named after my grandmother. So when colonialists came to Africa, they would forcibly remove children from their parents and throw them in orphanages. My grandmother did not know her parents. She did not know her African name. She was brought up in an orphanage by a group of German monks because they wanted them to be Christian. She lost her identity. She lost everything by that. And African names have a meaning to them. So when I was born, she named me after her. And I have not corrected the misspelling of my grandmother's name because through me, her story continues. Does that make sense? So they ask you, what is a fun fact about you? Now type in the chat, give me one fun fact, something that people don't know about you that you can share. Because again, sometimes we don't know what that fun fact is. And as people are, are typing in the chat, now you're going to think, oh, yeah, 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 that's like me. There is something about me that's different. Are you with me? So type in the chat. Okay, somebody's been to uh, Vietnam. A volunteer as a firefighter. Go. For, oh, that's nice. <laughs> you used to be a professional clown. I love this. You've got me thinking, Lerato. You see what I'm saying? This is why you came on the webinar, so that you have the answers to these TED questions when you submit your application. Absolutely love this. Thank you for participating, everybody, because that's why we're on the call, so we can really get our creative juices going. And then they also ask you, what is your favorite talk and why? So I told you, I live on TED. I watch a TED talk every morning, every evening, every single day. I look for inspiration. And the TED talk that inspires me the most is a, a TED talk by a guy called Dennis Shivers. I think it's called um, The Tribes We Lead or How to Create a Tribe. No, How to Start a Movement. It's called How to Start a Movement. And it's about this crazy guy who had gone to some festival and he gets up and he randomly starts dancing and he looks really weird. And then somebody thinks, oh, that's pretty cool. And they come and join him. And then another person joins him. And the next thing he knows, he's got a crowd of people doing these crazy dances, right? That's how you start a movement. And then he, he articulates in this TED talk, and it's a five minute TED talk. He says to start a movement, it's not about the leader. It's the leaders are the people who follow. 
Can you see? He's talking about leadership in the most um, unusual way. Do watch that TED Talk. It's five minutes. It has had millions of views. In five minutes, he told a short story that got straight to the point, made him absolutely famous in terms of a, as being a leadership speaker, a leadership coach. Okay, so the other thing they'll ask you, it's a long application. Um, what do you hope to learn out of the TED speaking experience? Or why is a TED talk the right platform for you to share your idea? Again, food for thought. Then they ask about your speaking experience and they ask you for links to all of your, your websites. So it's a long application, ladies. Had you ever looked at the TED Talk form before? Anyone? Yeah, so I'll email this to you. I'll email you mine. The questions are in there. You can just substitute, look at what I've done and use it as a, as a model to follow, okay? That's a little bonus for you sticking around until this late. <laughs> All right, so I'll go back to my presentation now and um, let's see here. Where were we? So now we've gone through the application process and let me now share some real little nuggets of my wisdom. Remember how I said that my mom used to say that so long as you're this side of the grave, never give up. I've had a rocky life with so many ups and downs. I could talk on literally any subject. <laughs> from depression to entrepreneurship to social justice. I actually have about 15 presentations I can give on a TED platform and I'm constantly creating new content so that when I see a TED talk that's in my area, I can pitch myself because I'm talking from so many different perspectives. Right now I'm actually working on a TED talk on grief. And it's based on what I'm doing to cure myself and connecting with other people online who are grieving as well. So make it as versatile as you possibly can. That versatility is what will get you there. So I want to reward you for coming this far. <laughs> Let's just unmute and give me some feedback while I take a short break and, and, and tell me your thoughts. What have you got out of the presentation so far? Anyone, just unmute yourself. That's it. Yes. Um, well, I loved that you, firstly, are fellow African, and that just everything about the, your vibrancy and the heart came out through this. So I. Thank you. Where are you from? I am from KwaZulu Natal. KwaZulu. I'm, yes. Oh, I'm John, <laughs> <laughs> and I and I um yeah I just you know everything you talked about resonated but it was the way and this was why I you know I came to the presentation was to was to hear you know how do you condense something how do you you know speak succinctly but it was also because I was completely interested in you and 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 to feel that heart and, and that came across. So thank you very, very much. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you after on another day. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and ladies, don't be scared to be vulnerable. As women, our vulnerability is our strength. Yeah, it's true. Do you know, I've spoken in audiences where I have men come up to me and say, I've never cried in public before. <laughs> and thank you for allowing me to cry. Thank you. I gave a presentation in Hastings on the East Coast. The mayor of Hastings had a problem because people were committing suicide. It was 2007. There was a drought and people were giving up. They had loans. They couldn't pay back. And he called me. He had heard me speaking at a local government conference. And he said, Gertrude, please come in. I need, I need you. And I said, I'm not a psychologist. What can I say to people who are in such despair. And he said, Gertrude, when I first heard you speak, I felt like you were holding up a mirror to my life. And for the first time, I knew exactly where I was in the world. 
I knew my kids would never go hungry. I live in a country with a social welfare system. I mean, look at the way New Zealand has responded to COVID-19. The support we all got in terms of the wage subsidies for entrepreneurs and our social welfare system really kicked in to keep people going, right? So I went and he booked out a theater that seats a thousand people. I didn't think anybody would come. It was in July, in the middle of winter. I'm thinking who's gonna show up at this damn thing? And two weeks in, I called him two weeks before the event and he says, get you, we sold out on tickets. I'm like, what do you do? He said, we've sold out, please come. And I said to my ex-husband at the time, I'm going to print a thousand copies of my book and I'm going to give it away. I had a coach who said to me, Gertrude, why are you selling your book? I don't know if you guys know Bob Proctor. Mm -hmm. I ended up speaking with Bob Proctor in the Palladium Theater in London. That was my biggest speaking event. I was the only woman. There was 5,000 people at this event and I got him to myself and we became friends. And he said, Gertrude, you are putting a lid on how much people can help you. You're selling this book for $35. I would give you a thousand bucks. He said, give it away and see what happens. So if any of you are speakers who are people who have a social cause, give your book away and see what happens. My book prints for $3.18. I sell it for $35 and I started giving it away. I printed a thousand copies put a book underneath everybody's seats. Halfway through my presentation, I just said to everybody, I have a gift for all of you. There's a copy of my book underneath your seat and I've personally signed it because I want you to take my story with you so you can hold on to hope and know that things are gonna change. Life is cyclical. It's got its ups and its downs. And when you hit rock bottom, hold on to your seat belt because the only way from here is up. And then I had some girlfriends who had come to the conference and I asked them to bring some baskets. And I said, my girlfriends are going to be at the door as you leave the venue. If you have any loose change, please. It cost me $3.80 to print. I just want to recover my printing costs. Do you want to know how much money I made that day? I made $10,000 by giving my book away. People mm -hmm. emptied out their purses. There was one man who came and waited until everybody had left. And he said, Gertrude, I need to talk to you personally. And we sat down, went and had a coffee. And he said, Gertrude, you saved my life. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I was on a cliff about to drive my car over a cliff. When the notes from the mayor's office came into my mailbox, that there was an inspiring speaker from Africa who was coming to talk to the farmers today. I was writing an email to my wife asking for her forgiveness for what I had to do. You know, your personal story can save somebody's life. Yeah. Yeah. Your personal story can change the trajectory of somebody's life forever. He gave me a check of $1,000. He said, I do not have money. Just hold on to this check as a promise. Two years later, he called me and said, Gertrude, go and cash the check. The money's in the bank. So inspiration can move mountains. Another coach of mine put a line in my speech that quadrupled my sales. Mark Victor Hansen wrote Chicken Soup of the Soul. He became a personal friend and a mentor. He said to me, Gertrude, people need permission to buy multiple copies of your book. If you say buy a book, they'll come at the end of the speech, they'll buy one copy. And he put a line at the end of my speech where I say, buy one for yourself, buy one for someone you love, buy one for someone who needs inspiring. People buy five, six, 10 copies because I've suggested they can buy a book for someone else. You know how people buy things for Christmas presents? I get people coming and buying 10 copies. I put that line I was in Timaru and I changed the line. It was a rotary conference. And I thought there were about 150 people who came from all over New Zealand. I thought, what if I say buy a box of books instead? And I said, I know you've come from all over New Zealand. You come from different clubs. A box of my books costs $980. I suggest you buy a box to take back to your club members and help me fundraise. 17 boxes were sold that day. $17,000 worth of book sales, one event. 
And that's what being an author and a speaker can do for you. Especially if you can write a book where you can tie the percentage of your, your, your takings to a cause. Because people love change makers. People love people who are doing something in their communities and helping out in some way. So that's it's all about being an author. And I want to teach you how to do all of these things. I've had a fantastic speaking career. So one of the other things I want to gift you is I've written a book called Speaking from the Heart. It's coming out on the 1st of August. You'll get access to the ebook. If I forget, just remind me, but I'll try and get that out through my mailing list. And I've already said that I'm also going to give you the opportunity to um, participate in in the coaching. So now I'm going to share with you a few more little nuggets of wisdom before we open up for a Q&A session where we can really talk about each individual person. I told you that the way I got started was by doing things for free. My highest speaking price in New Zealand was about seven and a half thousand. Then I did a tour, a speaking tour of Australia with a coach who was coaching entrepreneurs. And he said to me, get you to come in and be the inspiring speaker at the end of the day. We did a seven city, seven day tour of Australia. He paid me seven and a half thousand dollars a day. I made 40, over $50,000 that week. At the airport, as he was taking me to the airport, he wrote down on a napkin the blueprint to his business. He does what's called a one-to-many coaching. So in every city that we went to, there was an average of 150 to 200 people. At the end of the week, we had touched on 1,000 people. He was charging $499 for this one-day workshop. At the end of the day, I would come in for an hour and inspire people. Uh, somebody has a baby crying. Can I ask you to mute? It's lovely to hear that we've got the babies with the moms. And yeah, so he, he does this thing. So in that week, he generated a quarter of a million because people would bring a friend. So if you market to 10 people and they bring a friend, you've got 20 people in the room. So that's how I coach. I have this one-to-many coaching and I have my one-to-one -one coaching. So as a speaker, you can turn your book into a coaching program where you can teach other people to do what you do. I've made more money teaching people to do what I do than to do what I do. Does that make sense? And some people say to me, but get you, you're giving away your secrets. The thing about speaking is each of us has got a unique signature in how we articulate. Nobody can copy and be Gertrude. They might go online and record my presentation and try and do it, but they will never do it like me. And so don't, don't hold on to your ideas out of the fear that somebody might copy. I find it's a compliment if somebody copies me. If I've inspired someone else to do it, I'm like, I've done my job. So don't be scared to share your ideas. You can really create an amazing business if you teach what you do than doing what you do. So volunteering gives you exposure. It's free exposure. Volunteering diversifies your content so you're not a one horse pony. And I model of what other people are doing. I, I don't believe in reinventing the wheel. If I see somebody who's doing something really well, I wanna know how they did it. And I'd rather copy them than starting from scratch. So where do you want to be in three years time? Can you see the payoff of sticking around and listening to this presentation tonight? I really hope that you're taking home some real little nuggets and understanding the importance of getting a coach. So I got a coach, his name is Alex Mandosian, and he's now coaching me to create an eight-figure business with my speaking platform. And he's given me the opportunity to offer 20 women to come and be coached by him. He costs 30,000 US dollars and I'll share a little video about him and I'll send you some information about him. But he's somebody who markets for Mark Victor Hansen, Jack Canfield, Bob Proctor. You just Google Mark, um, Alex Mandosian is his name. 
absolutely fascinating guy, but I'll share his information. So I'm looking for 20 women out of this webinar who would like to come and be coached with me and Alex. Type in the chat if you're interested, then I can send you some information. So I looked at other people around me, the thought leaders, because I want to be known as a thought leader. The Bob Proctors, the John D. Martinis, I started attending their workshops, doing things with them online, seeing how they were doing it. And then I ended up on stage with them. It was like the, the law of attraction really works because you have to put yourself in the room with these people sometimes. And now you have to put yourself on the platform with these people sometimes. You know, like right now, the other opportunity I have for you ladies is I was approached by a UK company who have an event called uh, the, the Best of You or Best of You. They are launching an online conference as an expo from the 1st of August to the 7th of August. And they have given me uh, 44 slots if I want to bring any of my Her Story women to speak. So it's an online conference. They've got people like Les Brown. They've got Jack Hanfield. So I became famous by association. When I did the Akasha event, people started to Google looking for Bob Proctor and there's little old me. I, I wasn't famous. And then I have a photograph and I'm having dinner with him and he's now a personal friend. So sometimes you have to be on their platforms. You have to be in their world for you to be connected and associated with them. So that's another opportunity. If anybody wants that, let me know. I've only got 46 slots. So I did the Akasha event and it changed the whole digital footprint. It put me on that level of thought leaders. And then I started helping other people to create their own brands. When my first TED talk went on YouTube, I got visibility. I was approached by a billionaire. I don't know if you know American football, there's a football team in, in, in the United States called the Steelers. It's owned by the Rooney family. Mrs. Rooney was a professor at a university in Pittsburgh. And when she retired from her post, she created a position called the Rooney International Scholar. And they bring in poets, they bring in authors, philosophers, musicians to come and bring the world to these rich American kids. I got a six month teaching opportunity as a professor, I do not have a PhD. And they paid me $10,000 a month to lecture two hours a week. I had a fully furnished house. I had a beautiful car. I actually wrote my second book while I was there. But I got what was called a J-1 visa. And a J-1 visa is for academics. You can, anyone can get it, so long as a university is sponsoring you. So I have been lecturing in universities all over the world. <laughs> you need a PhD to lecture in the US. I don't have it. I don't have it. But once you've done it in one academic institution, now you've got your credibility. Does that make sense? So my, my little memoir transferred from being a story of a woman to an academic textbook. And when you lecture in universities, they pay you and they buy the book in bulk. That's where you get bulk sales. I did a presentation for a university in Slovakia the other day. They found me through YouTube. So I lecture in social anthropology. I'm not an anthropologist, <laughs> but Ubuntu is, is taught in social anthropology and there's no books. So I crossed over to another world. So the summary about getting sponsorship is about working smart, not hard and not trying to reinvent the wheel. It's about following leaders and learning to repurpose your content, your intellectual IP. Do you know that if you write a book in English, you can sell it in other languages? So I, be I belong to a group of feminist publishers. I've got a publishing company here in New Zealand. And every October, I take people's books. I only specialize in women's memoirs. I take people's books to the Frankfurt Book Fair. You can sell your book in German, in English, in, in, in French, in Italian. You get paid an average of five to 35,000 euro per language. Per language, it's crazy. Imagine if you got 10 foreign language buyers to buy your book, what that could do for you. And then now you're earning the residual income 
Because every time a book is sold, you're getting royalties. Does anybody have a memoir? Somebody said they have. Wayona, you have? Anybody else? Good. Share your personal story. And I coach people to write their stories. I actually have a process called How to Write a Book in 40 Hours. My first book took me 17 years to write. The next one took me 40 hours. And I'm going to share a video of how I did that. I can't dive into that right now. But it's just amazing what happens when you have your own content. And in Frankfurt, there are also people who buy books for movies. So now your book becomes a movie script. I'm actually working on my own movie script right now. It's another product. Your book, if you're a, an entrepreneur and you have a business process that you teach, your book can be turned into a board game. Robert Kiyosaki has games that people play about business and property investing. You can do the same thing. So now it's about you creating a, a speaking business that has multiple streams of income. Multiple, it's not just the speaking. It's about your intellectual IP, the ideas that you have that you can teach somebody else. Okay, leverage. I'm going to share with you a little bit about leverage. I told you how Mark Victor Hansen put this line in my speech, buy one for yourself, buy one for someone you love, one for someone who needs inspiring. Mark taught me how to convert a room, how to work out my conversion to show my success when I speak. Would anybody like to get a copy of my memoir? Put in the chat. I'm calculating my conversion right now. So every time you speak, if there's 100 people in the room, ask them if they would like to have a copy of your book. When you come home, you calculate how many books did I sell. My conversion rate is 70%. When I speak, I know 70% of people who listen to me will walk away with my book. And you then have to tweak your presentation. Your, your speech is a working document. It's constantly changing based on the feedback you're getting from people. So if I go to an event and I didn't quite get the 70%, I think, okay, I missed something. I didn't say something. So I ask people for feedback. So I'm going to give you a form at the end of this presentation. And I want you to be brutally honest about today's presentation. If this presentation is not a 10, tell me why. So that when I deliver it the next time, I know I can do better than I did now. You have to be a work in progress the whole time. Get people to give you feedback so you improve. So that is the Mark Victor Hansen story. And to summarize on leverage, you have to acknowledge and celebrate your worth. I had an experience where I got a call from Florida it was the International Coaching Federation were looking for a guest speaker for the conference. They had about 3,000 people coming to this event. I hadn't spoken in America at that level before. I didn't know how much to charge. So I called my dad in Zimbabwe and I said, Dad, I have this opportunity. I have no idea how much I should ask for. And my father, before he died, gave me the best advice he ever gave me. He said to me, Gertrude, the fact that they called from Florida means you've made an impression on someone. Close your eyes. Think of a number. Don't worry about it ask for what you want. So I called back to this person and I said $15,000 an hour. Within two days, they wrote back and they said, fantastic, send us your contract. I was shocked. I never had made that kind of money before. So I, I sent through my contract and people book me to speak. They pay 50% up front, 50% when I've done the job. A week later, I have $15,000 in my bank account and I thought they made a mistake. So I called the lady. I said, look, you've paid me in full. She said, no, 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 we, we paid half. I said, no, but I have 15,000 in my account. She said, no, we paid seven and a half. I meant New Zealand dollars. And at the time, the New Zealand dollar to the US was one to two. I made $30,000, 30. And because I knew my conversion, I asked them how many books I should bring to sell. And that's the other reason why you have to work out these stats. And so I asked how many books to ship. They said 150. Nobody ever sells 150 copies. And I said, do you mind if I ship 500 copies? She said, no, 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 nobody will sell that amount. I said, I, I know my conversion rate. I will sell them. Guess how many books I sold at a conference with 3,000 people? 900 copies. I made almost $100,000 at one event 
because I had a book, because I knew my conversion. So if you show up without the books, the likelihood that people will buy, people buy in the moment. So if you've got the books there and the platforms that I publish, it somebody mentioned a little bit earlier, it is Kindle publishing. So when you're flying or you're traveling somewhere else, you just go online and you order your books online and they're shipped direct to the location where you're doing your speech, as opposed to having to carry books and then pay excess baggage and, and all of that stuff. So if you get clear what your conversion is, you can ship the appropriate number of books and know that you will sell them. So that's really important to know your conversion and to create your own community. That's what I'm doing with her story. I can see that there's a few people here from her story. Linda, I know you're on the call. Um, uh, Rosemary, you're in the States, you're on the call. These are women who have come into my community by my creating my own platform. So your platform could be something else. It could be a group of spiritual healers or people who have alternative um, healing methodologies. You can create a whole community of people based on what you do and interact with them. So it's about community building. Okay, we're almost done. The last thing I want to share with you is about understanding your brand. So if I said, close your eyes and think of Coca-Cola, what colors come to mind? Just type in the chat. Coca-Cola, the brand. <coughs> Red, white. Red, white, yes. That's the Coca-Cola colors. And black. Thank you, Nat. If I said Nike, what image comes to mind? The tick. So Nike has used a symbol. If I said Microsoft, what comes to mind? Again, it's a symbol and a combination of colors. So for everyone, you need to have what's called your own brand identity. And for you to be a really powerful speaker, and to earn a six-figure income in the next 30 days, you don't need an online presence. You don't need a mailing list. You don't need credibility. You don't need speaking experience. I can show you how. This is one of my clients. Tuva Vine, I'm going to share my screen, is a client of mine based in Australia. When I met her, she was 57. She had gone through a divorce, sold everything she had, packed her bags, and went to teach English in China. Tuva created her whole brand around the Chinese culture. So her logo is Tuva in Mandarin Chinese. You can see the symbol. So I take people through a branding workshop where we get really clear. Who are you? What is the brand? What is it going to look like? She picked these colors and these images. So you look at the color palette that goes with you. We look at the patterns that go with your branding. We look at the font. Something as simple as a font can say a lot about you. So when I was branding myself, the one thing I want you to think about and type in the chat, what three words best describe you as a brand? All of you, just tell me what you think your three words are. I got my three words from a testimonial that I got from one of my friends. It was one of my clients and she said something like, Gertrude is a vibrant bundle of African energy. The three words I pulled out, number one was African. Whenever I'm speaking, I show up as being African first. I'm wearing my traditional African clothes. I'm proud of that because I can't do anything about the skin that I have, right? <laughs> but I also didn't want people to mistake me as being African American or Caribbean or just someone of African descent. I wanted them to say there's this amazing African speaker. She's based in Wellington. You've got to book her. So my brand is clear. I show up as being African first. The second word I picked was the word vibrant. You can see the colors in my house. You can see the way that I'm dressed. I wear very vibrant colors. So that goes with my personality. What is that for you? For somebody who's conservative, you would wear conservative colors, right? And it has to feel right for you so that when you're on stage, you're feeling comfortable. The last thing about my brand is energy. The energetic part of my brand is reflected with the fonts that I use to write my book covers, my, my name on my book covers and my marketing material on my website. 
So something as simple as a font can say a lot of things about you. So Tuva comes to me, she has this amazing story, doesn't know how to speak, doesn't know how to write. This is what we did for her. I ghost wrote three books for her. When she told me her story, I could clearly see three books. She had a 900 page manuscript. She was a walking manuscript. And people aren't able to consume content. A 900 page book doesn't sell, it's too long. So the recommendation in the Frankfurt Book Fair is that your book should be between 250 to 300 pages maximum. That's about 50,000 to 65,000 words. If you deliver more than that, the foreign language buyers won't buy your book. So you're better off creating a series of books like the Twilight series of books. Episodic books are doing better in terms of sales when you can tell your story in three phases. I'm actually working on, my, on the second phase of my, my memoir right now. So every 10 years, I'm rewriting my memoir. Does that make sense? So this first book, Tuva decided that we would use these acronyms for the titles of her book. So TIC stands for This is China. It's her first 10 years in China. And it's a saying that people say, in Africa, if somebody comes to Africa, everything goes wrong. And we just say, this is Africa. But in China, they say, tick, this is China. So her first book is based on her experience living in a foreign country, what she experienced. And she shares that in that first book, the first 10 years. The next book is called MAD. Again, we're using acronyms. This is part of her branding. And MAD stands for making a difference. So after she lived there for 10 years, she developed a nonprofit. She started sponsoring little girls in orphanages, and she has done some amazing work in China around orphaned children, and particularly getting little girls to get an education. And then I saw the workshop in her story that she couldn't see. And the workshop is she could teach other women like her who've gone to, through a separation, who've gone through a divorce, who are widowed, who are at a crossroads in their lives and are trying to reinvent themselves, and they could go and teach English in China. She's done it. She's got the expertise. She's got 10 English schools in China. So now she recruits people. She coaches them if they want to find a job somewhere else. And it changed everything for Tuva Vine. So that's what happens when you have a book. So this is what she shared with us tonight, a small little video and there's a few things in this video I want you to pay attention to and I'll pause at each point so you can see what you need to do about yourself. Have you ever dreamt of having great adventures, traveling to exotic places and making a real difference in people's lives? Friend, 2003, having coffee with a friend at the Rogers Coffee Shop in the Queensbury Mall. And I was. Now, she put captions in that video. Tuva, I think, comes from the Netherlands, so English is not very clear. And there was a lot of background noise as she's speaking. So she put captions so people could actually read what she's saying. So if you have a video and you've spoken somewhere and it's not clear, but the video quality is good, use it, but put captions. Sharing with her my own interest in life. In fact, I was complaining. And she listened patiently. And then she said nine words that would change my life forever. She said, why don't you go to China to teach English? Thank you. Four months later, I was in China teaching English. You can change your life, and it doesn't matter how old you are, but how brave you are. My story started at age 57, when I decided to sell most of my belongings, put on a backpack, and went to China to teach English as a second language. Now, 10 years later, I've had a brilliant life, made a difference to thousands of children. I have made 100 trips around the world. Most of those trips were teaching English as a volunteer in isolated orphanages throughout Asia. My books, TIC, This is China, and MAD, Making a Difference in China, are about my adventures 
traveling across the East over the past 10 years. I was brave enough to leave behind everything that was familiar and set out on a journey of discovery. I have been to the top of the world, Mount Everest, twice. I have traveled across the roof of the world and I've touched people's lives in a... Another thing about Tuva, the way she dresses. Remember how I said that her whole branding is around the Chinese culture? So she has jackets that are made in China and very vibrant colors as well. So that's something else in terms of her branding. Positive way. I could never have imagined my life would be so rewarding after 60. She's amazing, inspiration. She's a fantastic person. The thing I loved the most was just making a difference. I thought it was great and I could see how passionate she is about working with children yeah. and helping them. Well, everybody has a story. And Jovi is an example of the determination, determination and will of women. And uh, I said hi to Jovi. She makes a lot of difference in people's lives. What she's doing in China is very admirable. And I have to say, she is an amazing woman. And get her just, just, and the story is, it's like, it's unbelievable. Tuva, she's awe inspiring. She has a message that is a message everybody should hear, especially women who reach their the middle, middle part of their life. She'll change her life if you listen to her. Thank you. Okay, so you all need to get a video trailer where you are speaking or get a collection of presentations you've done, synthesize them together. I can help you with that. That's something I do for my, my authors and speakers as well. And you saw how she used the video testimonials at the end where other people are talking about her and endorsing her. That's what you can do when you have the right content. So imagine if a TED organizer wanted to enroll you and you send them one of those little videos. They see you speaking, they see other people talking about you, they see what you've done. That's a really important thing. If you're an author, if you're a speaker, you need what's called a show reel, where you show yourself speaking. Remember how I said they have to hear you, the sound bite? That is absolutely crucial in everybody's speaking careers. So I'm going to end with just telling you a little bit about my coaching program. And then if you want to stick around, we can stick around and I can get to know you a little bit better and see how I can help you. Um, I have three levels of coaching. I've created a digital product. The other thing about speaking is creating content that can be sold over and over and over again. And you're not there doing the teaching and video is what people are doing right now. So I've actually digitized my speakers coaching program. People buy it for a thousand dollars US. That is my level one coaching. My level two coaching is a video course on how to write a book in 40 hours and how to speak from the heart. So I've combined the two, but people also get access to me in a group setting with 10 other people. So I meet them every two weeks, but people can email me once a week with questions and I respond with video uh, messages. So you know how on Zoom right now you can record anything and send your customers that link. And they actually feel, because you're, you are talking to them, but you're not wasting time sitting in a session with them one-on-one, because -on -one, that's quite time consuming. And it's about exchanging your, your hours, not exchanging your hours for dollars. So that's another thing. And then my last piece of coaching is when I ghostwrite for people. And that's a $10,000 package. If anybody's interested and you want a book written really fast, get hold of me. So this is my mentor who I will be sharing with anybody who buys the Speaking from the Heart package because what I want to do is I'm looking for a hundred women in New Zealand who could potentially come on board as part of the Her Story conference and run events and we share 50-50 whatever profit we make. At all of my conferences, I have 100 speakers who actually pay to speak on the platform, $440. If you have 100 women there, it's already 45,000 that's made just from the speakers. 
We also curate books. So we have an anthology series of books. Every woman contributes a chapter to a book so they get published. That's the other thing that they're getting out of the conference. And we have a Her Story magazine. We've got a Her Story TV. So I'm looking for 100 New Zealand women. We are so lucky. We're in this country where we could actually meet. And maybe you could join me and run a conference for Her Story and learn how to run your own conferences that way. So if anybody commits to getting a package for speaking from the heart, you're going to be coached by my coach. And this is Alex Mandosian. I'll put him on screen, make a note of his name. He actually shared a small video. He's in California, so he couldn't be here. But he decided just to share a video. You can Google him and I'll send you some information about him. And since he took me on, I'm making about 15,000 every week US with my get webinars. Ready, get ready, get set, and let's grow, grow, grow. Hi, I'm Alex Mondosian, and I have no idea if you and I have ever met. Um, it's a bad hair day for me. I'm in a hotel, I'm in transit, but I'm doing this for Gertrude because I know you are one decision away from changing your life. I have a couple questions for you. And I have no idea how this is going to come off, because if we don't know each other, you may think that I'm a little over the top. If we do know each other, you know that I'm living into the person I pretend to be. Uh, Socrates said the greatest honor to live in this world is to be the person we pretend to be. And I read that every time I'm on stage. I've been online since 1995, before Google was even born. I'm a BG direct marketer and digital marketer, BG, before Google. And I mentored Gertrude for many years, over a decade ago. And here's my question. What if you could transform your annual income into a monthly income? What if there were possible right here, right now, one year from now? What would your life look like? What would your business life look like? What would your relationships look like? Would they change? I think they would. Now, I asked that question in 2001, and I turned my annual income into a monthly income within 11 months doing the things you're about to do. Now, there are two types of fears that I face. Number one, the fear of failure, and that's the fear of embarrassment, the fear of not getting done the right things and uh, failing, right? But that fear doesn't even hold a candle to something that is 10 times as worse, which is the fear of success. The fear of success is about shame. Fear of failure is about guilt. Fear of success is about shame, and that's about you not being proud of who you are. And I'll tell you something, in education, if you get an F in a university, in grammar school, in high school, at least where I come from, from the United States, you don't move on. But if you fail in business, then you know one more way not to do something. If you want to double your success rate, you double your failure rate. And there are two types of mindsets. The first mindset that you're in, I hope you're not in this one, is I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to do the best I can. I'm going to play not to lose. And ladies, I have 65% of my list are women. I have over 800,000 people that I've taught over the past 25 years. The ladies in my list have taught me over the years, they play not to lose. That is not the way to win because you can't win any game playing defense. You have to do whatever it takes. You got to play offense. You have to play to win because when you play a winnable game, whatever game you're playing, you only have two options as results. You either win or you learn. And both options are great. Those are win-win. You go to heaven without the inconvenience of dying. Okay, if you keep watching, then I assume that you like what you're seeing. Maybe you don't, maybe you do. But whatever you're offered today, tonight, this morning, whatever time it may be, it could be $10,000, it could be $1,000, it could be coming on a, on a road trip with me and Gertrude and on a journey that would get you something worth 30,000 for 1,000 or a possibility to license something that would be worth 100,000 for 10,000. So she likes to give 90% off. So I want you to know, no matter what the decision is, it's never about the money, it's about priority. What does that mean? That means if I were to ask you for $10,000 tomorrow, and I told you that I would give you Google stock at the initial public offering, IPO price of uh, 2004. It was under $100. And you could sell it within six months for the current stock price, which is around 
1,400 US dollars. Would you come up with $10,000? Would you come up with $1,000? It's never about the money. It's about priority. The principle of priority is knowing the difference between what's important and what's urgent and doing what's important first. Now, I've made $1.2 million in less than half an hour, and that was in 2007. Um, I've generated over $417 million in the past 30 years for my partners, my students, and for myself, but my mother still doesn't know what I do. So I'm a big shot in a small pond, and for the people who do know me, they think highly of me, but if you've never met me, you probably don't even care. So what I'm asking you to do is keep listening to Gertrude because you and I may cross our paths again and you will be getting access to a $30,000 training for $1,000. Keep listening, keep watching, and I hope our paths cross soon. All good wishes. Thank you. So what Alex has offered is to help me license my, my coaching business my speaking business. Instead of my running around the world, running events, I can't do that anyway because of COVID-19, right? I can teach other women in other parts of the world to buy a license. And that's now my $10,000 package where I'm coming in as a business coach. I'm showing you how I've done it here and you can do it wherever you are. Does that make sense? So I will be sharing him with you. I will send you all this information. These are some of the people that he's worked with. Absolutely dynamic human being. I worked with him when I had my recruiting business for doctors. So my voice is gone. You can hear my voice is now hoarse. <laughs> it's now time for you to speak, ladies. Um, put in the chat anybody who would be interested in the $1,000 package to the um, $5,000 package or the $10,000 package where I will show you how to make the 10,000 or I'll show you how to make the 5,000 and you can create a business of your own so that after this event, we can collate who we need to contact and then unmute yourselves and let's now have a conversation. You might have questions. There might be something that I didn't cover. Unmute and um, let's get to see where you guys are at before we call it a day. Anyone? Just, yes. All right, thank you so much um, for your time and for um, the wealth of knowledge that you've actually passed to each and every one of us. I do appreciate um, your time and also your uh, generosity. I mean, I think Africans are, are known to be <laughs> very generous people. <laughs> um, so um, I do appreciate that. Um, actually, I've, I've just started on this journey okay. of um, coaching and mentoring. Um, I'm, I'm a lecturer. I lecture in social work. I'm also a pastor's wife. So I mentor a lot of um, uh, female ministers uh, under the platform of um, my church. But okay. I can also see across, across the world, I have people you know, who actually contact me you know, for counseling, for direction. I launched my company, who do I say it's a company, um, this, this uh, last month, June 1st, it's called Fragrance of Influence. And that is just to empower women leaders. You know, I call it Fragrance of Influence, um, preparing women for life. Um, nice. Yeah. So, but at this stage, um, I've, I've signed up, you know, with a woman and she's also from my country. She's in Canada at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're just in that process of her taking me through what I need to do mm -hmm. uh, because I've been in New Zealand, you know, for about 18 years. I've done lots of voluntary work. My kids are actually tired of me giving and giving and they saying, mom, you need to put a stop to this. You have values and you need to actually scale up, you know, so that you can actually serve your value, you know, with excellence and you can hand something from it. 
So that is the, the space that I am, you know, at now. I really appreciate um, your, um, I mean, what you've gone through, what you've been able to, to achieve in New Zealand. And I'm hoping that we're still going to have one-on-one -on -one where I can actually open up, you know, um, to you with regards to my journey in New Zealand. Um, the, 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 the question, or maybe what I really want clarity, clarity around is what each of these coaching, um, I mean, what you mentioned the, the 1001, you mentioned the 2001, and you mentioned the 10,001. I think so it, I need- it's, it's one, five, and 10. In oh, one, okay. you're, you're doing it All yourself. Right. It's a video course. Oh, on how right. to end your TED talk. So it's, it's self paced, it's online, mm -hmm. you do it by yourself. Okay, awesome. Middle one, it's two products it's how to write a book in 40 hours, it's the coaching. So it's, it's, a, it's two video courses, but you get access to me. Oh, okay. You can awesome. Email me every week and I respond with video emails. Yes. And you can also, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, we, we meet in a group setting. I put people in groups of 10. So I get more intimate with that one. And I give you an hour of my time every two weeks in between oh, okay. email. But every two weeks we meet as a group. We share where we're at. We share the videos we've recorded. We give each other feedback. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of trying to create a community. So you're not on your own. Even if I'm not there, one of the people in your group, you can reach out to someone and say, hey, can you just watch my video? Mm -hmm. It's all about community building. Yes. In terms of coaching. And then my $10,000 package is when I ghostwrite. I actually write the book for you and get it published on Amazon and Kindle. And I'm also at that level able to help you create your own platform, like what I've done with her story. Awesome. Awesome. Gertrude, <clears throat> Arapata here. Hey, Arapata, nice to see you. Ah, it's good, good to time. see you again. Yes, it has. Um, sister, how long is the 5,000 and the 10,000 courses? They're six month programs. Ah, good. Six months. Wonderful. Yeah, we literally will handhold you and you will have Alex at that five and the 10. I'm trying to persuade him even at the, at the 1,000 to put people in but he had said just the two middle ones he's worth his weight in gold when i had my recruiting company for doctors he helped me i used to fly to california every month to get coaching from him he can help you change everything i started back with him uh, about four weeks ago and that's when i started seeing this revenue every time i do a webinar i'm making 15 to twenty five thousand us so he's incredible. He's really Can nice. I say just a little something, Gertrude? Mm -hmm. For those women looking into this, I just want to say, um, you don't know me, but I'm an indigenous grandmother, yes. Um, and Gertrude and I have met uh, online and have uh, created a really strong bond. It's maybe... Um, nerve wracking for you to step into your power but don't let that stop you allow your priorities to go beyond your imagination um i like gertrude travel all over the world never thought i would ever do what i do but i love it and if it's your passion get the tools you need you can hobble along no problem if that's your deal do it but if you are looking at this and you're going, well, oh, you know, especially those in the spiritual and the social field where you're thinking, I don't know, it sounds so business. If we as women don't get involved in the business side and bring it to a higher vibration, mm -hmm. we will get what we have in the world now. There COVID is a need for feminine energy right now. Serious. So important. Mm -hmm. It's so important because the masculine, uh, when people ask me, what do you think of all the mayhem in the world? Remember, it's always darkest before the dawn. And when you, we as women, when we're looking at children suffering, we wish we could be in their place. Well, we're in that place now. So I just want to say that I've worked with Gertrude before. 
I know her value and I know that she delivers. So good luck to you all. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that endorsement. Yeah, You're there welcome, is a sister. need for a feminine energy right now. The world is in a mess. And when you look at all of these events and you look at the lineup of speakers, mm. and in particular women of color, this is a time for us to step up and use our voices. Mm. Huge. I mean, I, I mean, since all of this stuff has been happening in the States with racism and I can't tell you the number of people who've approached me to give presentations and share my experience. Exactly. Actually, I have, a, I have a, a presentation called the condition of being black. I cannot blend in. I live in New Zealand. I'm now <laughs> married to a Polish guy and I have a stepdaughter who has blonde hair, blue eyes, beautiful little six year old. I took her to Wellington zoo the other day. And so she was walking with me. She was holding the map and a pen. And she jumped on a rock and she fell down, just a small little thing. And I had six people come up to me in anger, like I was her nanny and I was not taking care of her. Oh my goodness. She just jumped off a rock and she was fine. She just had a small little graze and she started laughing. Six people approached me about that child. She's my, my, my stepdaughter. And she defended me. She's like, she's my mom. What are you doing? It was so funny, but... It's happening here in New Zealand. And when yeah. you're not black, you don't realize what black people have to put up with. Now, I would say as a person Corey. of color, it's very strong here. Yeah. Gertrude, I, I'm really curious to know, you know, you came to New Zealand as an immigrant by yourself. Your husband wasn't even here with you. You came with your children. I'm, I'd love to know what kind of inner work you did that enabled you to jump into all the endeavors as an entrepreneur, et cetera, with, without fear? Or how did you surmount that fear? How did you, you sort feel, of you did feel you the fear and you do it anyway? You know, I come from a country where my back was against the wall all the time. If I wasn't moving forward, I, I just had to move forward. And something happens when you step out on faith. It's like jumping out of a parachute without an airplane without a parachute and growing your wings when you go down. <laughs> that's literally what it is. And if that's the universe will catch you. You know, when I went through my separation and divorce, I was married for 27 years. My marriage broke down. And I think uh, out of, that's when we met and I lost my sense of identity. I wasn't a mother. I wasn't a wife. My kids had grown up. It was just horrible. And I remember leaving New Zealand, packing a suitcase and traveling for almost two years, free falling through the universe. I went to 14 countries and I was lost. I was completely lost. I ended up in New Mexico, didn't have a, a, a work permit. I had a 90 day visa. I remember giving a speech for the Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce then people came up to me. I was actually coaching a dentist from Albuquerque online. And so he knew I was in the States and he said, get you, can you stop in Albuquerque and give a speech? I was going to California. So I stopped in Albuquerque, gave a speech, talked about everything I do. 10 people came up to me. I had $500, by the way. 10 people came up to me and said, would you extend your stay and, and run a workshop? We want to learn how to write a book. I had no idea how much to charge them. So I said, okay, $500. The owner of the venue I was giving the speech gave me a conference room for free that weekend. Weekend I landed in the States, I've made $5,000 like this because I know how to teach something, right? I ended up staying, found a little apartment. Somebody gave me a car. People just, people react when you are genuine, when you are authentic. The people in Albuquerque helped me. I found an apartment and I remember forgetting that I had a 90 day visa. I just got so consumed with everything I was doing. I had all these clients. <laughs> Day 89, I remembered I had to leave the States. Otherwise, if I, if my visa expired, they wouldn't let me back in. I went online at 2 a.m. in the morning, looked for a border to head to, and I headed to Mexico. I went to the most notorious border post in the world called Juarez. <laughs> This is where all the drug cartels are. You get beheaded for a passport there. I did not know. It looked like a border between Zimbabwe and South Africa. So I thought I won't go across with my car. Otherwise I'll spend the whole day trying to come back. Parked my car on the US side, walked across the border with confidence. 
when I got to this village square, these three little girls showed up like angels from nowhere. And they said, do you mind if we walk with you? We want to practice our English. I'm like, yeah, come along. I spent the day eating mangoes and watermelons. I'm seeing all these marks in the buildings. Didn't know what they were. Policemen had bulletproof vests. I'm thinking, gosh, it's really safe here. I come back in the evening. The guy at the border says to me, did you just walk across the border on your own? I'm like, oh, yes, I had a fantastic day. I had these huge flower pots that I bought from my house. He's like, where the hell are you from? I said, I'm from New Zealand. He said, this is the most notorious border post in the world. The, the marks on the walls were bullet marks. The police had bulletproof vests for protection. And these three little girls, I'm still in touch with them on Facebook, came out of nowhere and protected me for the day. Wow. So you feel the fear and you do it anyway. I did not have an option. The best gift that Africa gave me was not giving me a safety net. Wow. Women in the <laughs> West are fearful because they've got something they can fall back on. When you don't have that, believe you me, you jump off that cliff every single time. And the wings show up, the right people show up, your coaches, your mentors. The universe responds if you take action. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Anybody else want to share before we call it a night? Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. um, can I clarify when we talk about five thousand dollars? Okay, are you talking in terms of New Zealand dollars or is it U.S. dollars? Everything I everything I do is in U.S. Okay. And the payment plan I have is fifty fifty, and if somebody's really struggling, we can talk. Okay. All right. All right. Just reach out to me. We can work something out. Ruth, welcome. So I've put a link in the chat. Mm. And that is my feedback form. Please click on it before we leave. I will email it anyway. But just fill it in. The different options are there. The feedback that I need. It'll take you five minutes just for me to assess how much you got out of today's presentation. And Ruth is my dear friend in Zimbabwe. She is my virtual assistant. So what I try and do is to give work to women in Africa. So for those women who don't want to do anything in terms of social media, Ruth is your go-to person. She helps set up your Facebook, your Instagram, your Twitter, all of your social media uh, work. I outsource to Ruth and her team. Can I ask a question? Hello, everyone. Somebody wants to ask a question? Yes, sorry, it's Janine here. Can I ask a question about all the social media platforms? Do you suggest we have presence on all of them? Have presence on where you're targeting, where you're targeting. Yes. So LinkedIn and Facebook yeah. is where it's I am. Much to handle if you're too scattered. Yeah. Unless you have content that's relevant for the different demographics. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How can you connect with Ruth? Ruth, put in your, uh, her story email in the chat. So people can get that. And remember to put it in the email when we email out to people as well. Was this whole talk recorded? Because I came recorded, in. yes. So I, I will okay. send you the link. Thank you. You guys can watch this. I always record everything. And even if you're coaching yourself, record. Because I, I, I'm a, a listener. I do more when I listen than when I'm writing things down. But I do encourage people to write while I'm presenting because that just reinforces the, the learning. That's Ruth's email. So do reach out to her. Amazing woman. Uh, she can do anything that you need done online. Right. So we'll call it a night. It's been a fascinating evening meeting you all. We've gone for almost, what, two and a half hours. I love this. Thank you. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's change the world, ladies. It's one story at a time, one woman at a time for me. If I can empower you to find your strength and to get out into the world, then my job is done. Thank you for showing up and just for being here. I'm eternally grateful for you staying this long and taking it all in. And I hope it's been worth your while. And fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank Have you. Have a good evening. Stay in touch. <laughs> bye bye. bye. Contact Thank anybody you. who needs contacting on that form. Okay. All right. Thank you, Gertrude. Bye, Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Ruth. <laughs> hey, Ruth. How's it going, girl? 
Are you still there, Ruth? She's frozen again. <laughs> All right, I'll call you on WhatsApp. <laughs>